of students. All right, awesome. Well, welcome this morning, everybody. Gary, thank you for that uh, great sermon. Great, great uh, singing this morning. Before we jump into class this morning, I wanted to ask everyone, in fact, <coughs> our class two weeks ago, if you upped your praying for wisdom game. If you weren't praying for wisdom, if you started praying for wisdom, if you were already praying for wisdom, if you're praying for wisdom more after after that class, well, I have to be honest with you, and I feel like every time I get up to teach, I'm sort of confessing <laughs> something. You know, I probably over the last two weeks didn't pray for wisdom the way I should have. I still relied on myself and my my own thoughts. My own quest for wisdom and discernment, instead of, after encouraging you two weeks ago, turning to God and, and asking for that wisdom. So I looked back as I was preparing for this class today, and I think I'm finally starting to get it. I think I'm finally starting to understand that I really need to ask God, I need to seek God out and ask for his blessing of wisdom. So if you continued your past prayers of wisdom, or if you started a, a, a prayerful offering up to God for wisdom over the last two weeks, it's great for you, because I'm going to work on that this week. And I fully realized, as I continue this study, that I'm not going to get God's wisdom if I don't ask. I've got to seek it, or he's not going to give it to me. So I want to start this morning with a prayer, if you all will pray with me. Dear God, our Father in heaven, thank you for all the blessings that we have in this life. God, thank you for your church. God, especially for this group of Christians that are <coughs> gathered here today to sharpen our swords, to learn more about the life that you desire for us to live. Father, thank you. Thank you for the opportunity that you provide for us to ask you for wisdom. Father, when we do, we pray that you will answer those prayers. Father, we pray as we gather today and study today that you'll be with us today as we talk about the priorities in our lives. Father, we thank you for showing us the way, and we ask, Father, for wisdom. Wisdom to seek and follow what you've made available to us. And it's in Jesus Christ's name that we pray this prayer this morning. Amen. So everyone should have a piece of paper. Everyone, ask again, everyone got a piece of paper? Nope. Got ample opportunity for a piece of paper. Piece of paper? A little bit. I'll put a piece of paper right here. There's pens up here. We're going to use this paper throughout class today. So keep that with you. Keep a pen. Get ready to write. If you don't have one, Adam will get it for you. So to start our class today, I want you to take out that piece of paper and take out your writing stencil. And in section one on that paper, I'd like you to write down three things that you did yesterday. And if you want to just put them in your memory, you can. Three things that you did yesterday. It can be any three things that you want to put down. The three things you did on Christmas Day. And I prefer these to be the three things that occupied the most part of your time, the things that dominated your day. And you can say, oh, I spent time with family. But if you spent time with family and all you did is family, you watched the NBA all five games yesterday. <laughs> and I prefer that you say, I spent time with family watching the NBA, not I spent quality time with my family. Or I spent quality time with my family watching the NFL. You know, write down honestly what you did yesterday on Christmas, three things. I'll give you a second to do that. That's probably accurate. Most everyone probably only did three things yesterday. <laughs> Hugged my family. 
Got hugs. lot got lots of hugs, gave hugs, got hugs. That's one of the three things you did yesterday. You hugged a lot mm -hmm. yesterday. <laughs> Which I know is probably true because you love to hug. Mm -hmm. I ate too much. <laughs> First we had to cook it. <laughs> 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 that, that's probably the number one thing that people did yesterday. What else? Open gifts and gave gifts. Gifting. All right, bashful people. What you do yesterday? Spent time with neighbors. Spent time with neighbors. Prayed for wisdom. <laughs> it's a good thing that I know that everything comes out of Wayne's mouth as well. <laughs> we like it. Yeah. Watch Christmas Eve. Yeah. Yes. I had a wonderful life, but yeah. I'll stop there. I want to move on to the next section, section two. Under section two, I want you to think back to the last four Saturdays. If you're like me, that's going to be really, really hard. Uh -huh. What did I do the last four Saturdays? What are the three things that you did? The three most memorable, time-consuming. Time what did you spend your time on over the last four Saturdays? <laughs> Write those things down. They're just three. I don't want you to, again, I spent quality time with my family. Last four Saturdays, I think I watched 27 college football games. <laughs> That's probably not, probably goes under watching college football, not spending time. <laughs> Take a minute to do that. And try to focus in on the things that took the most amount of time or things that you spent your time with. For some, it would be eating and cooking, or watching TV and movies, spending time with neighbors. For Christy, it was hugging. <laughs> That's poor Saturday. Yes. She spent more time hugging than anything else. Okay, when you're done with that, I want to now change the mindset a little bit. Now, I want you to go to section three. So we're going to get this paper done fast, and we'll come back and revisit it at the end. But under section three, I want you to write down... What are the top three priorities for your life? So this may take a little more thought. I read the first chapter. <laughs> what are the top three priorities in your life? And this year, I really want you to put three in your memory and lock them in, or I want you to write them down because I want to revisit them later. Gary were to sit down with you in a counseling session and say, before we start this counseling session, I really want to understand what your top three priorities for the remainder of your life. What are the top three priorities? That's what I want you to put down here right now. I'm not going to give you any examples. I don't want to sway anybody. Wayne, good smoothie. <laughs> Everyone good and done? We're close enough? Got at least two? So when you look at the, the activities that you did yesterday, or the activities that you did over the past four Saturdays, your days off if you're working, your busy day if you're not working, <coughs> did the things that you did yesterday and over the past four Saturdays match up with your priorities? So if you, if you read over your top three priorities, or the things you did yesterday and the things you did over the past four Saturdays, are they leading you down the path of your priorities? Or are those the first things you would have picked if you read your priorities and said, 
I need to address number one priority today. Or I need to address number two priority today. I'm going to do this. If not, we'll, we'll have a chance to revisit that a little later. So since we're working from the book, I want to spend five minutes, maybe ten max, on the book Build Strong, chapter one. The chapter on the pillar of priority. I'm going to start with asking everyone a question. Who all's read the introduction and read the first chapter? All right. That's good. We're only spending five minutes on it. And after that, we'll, you can go back and reread it. For those who've read it, who all agrees with me that Steve has a real second child issue? <laughs> I mean, the guy really has a problem being the second child. He, he, he really does. And if, if you want to debate that, we can, we can do that later. <laughs> And I don't know about you, but he uses the story throughout this book of Jacob and Esau. Now, I'm going to actually restate that. He uses the story of Jacob and how Jacob acquired the things in his life, like Esau's birthright. How he acquired things like Esau's blessing from Isaac. How he acquired Laban's herd by interbreeding them so they were all streaked and spotted. He even how his wife Rebecca, Laban's daughter, stole all his household goods because they somehow deserved them. And I understand that Jacob had God's blessing in everything he did. But honestly for me, especially the way Steve used this and I'm going to pick the book, right? The way Steve views the story of Jacob and Esau, I much prefer the New Testament methods to the Old Testament methods. But enough about my prejudice. What, what did anyone else think of Steve's take on, on Jacob's inherent proper priority of his life versus Esau's lack of priority? Anyone? Anyone want to comment on that? He got approval for what all he did. He did. As a matter of fact, God came to him several times and said, I want you to do this. Or his mother came to him and said, I want you to do this, which is right up there next to God, right? <laughs> Any other thoughts? Yeah, I'm the eldest of two, and so I just kept thinking through all this, have I treated my younger brother fairly? It's a good question. Did Jacob treat Esau fairly? Not till the end, right? Had a little guilt? He probably did. Any other comments? Yeah, my intake on Steve's view of this, Jacob and Esau, is that God and God's will was fulfilled by the things that Jacob did. Agree with his tactics or not. But since I'm teaching this class, we're not going to spend a lot of time on this book. Not this week. Next week we'll probably spend a little more. We're going to spend the rest of our time today looking at what Jesus says to us about priorities. Looking at what the Apostle Paul says to us about priorities. So, to do this, I've distributed some scriptures among a lot of people here, and I'll ask you to read those. I won't ask you to read which one, because I don't remember which scripture I gave which person, but I'll ask for the scripture. So that we can see what Jesus and, and Paul had to say about our priorities. So let's start with what Jesus had to say specifically about priorities regarding seeking God's righteousness. Seeking God's righteousness is a first priority in our lives. So Jesus said this in Matthew 6 and verse 33. Since y'all know the scripture, sing it with me. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Alleluia. 
That's great. Jesus did sing all of the, uh, the uh, <laughs> but he did say, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. <clears throat> seek the kingdom. Seek righteousness as a first priority. Matthew 5 and 6. You don't have to sing it if you don't want to. <laughs> God blesses those who hunger and thirst for justice, for they will be satisfied. Another version of that, justice, righteousness. Hunger and thirst <coughs> are most core needs. Hunger and thirst for righteousness. So how do we seek first? How do we hunger and thirst for righteousness? How do we seek the kingdom of God as a priority? How do we do that? Spend time with him. Spend time with God. How many people spending time with God yesterday on Christmas Day, you did that more than three other things you did? I spent more time in prayer yesterday. I'm not making a statement for me, but how many people can make that statement? I spent more time in prayer yesterday on Christmas Day, the day that the world is celebrating Jesus' birth, than I did eating or watching pro football last night. We spent more time with God whether we realized it or not. We are. Sure. I spent a lot of time with God. But how much time am I spending with God? How do we seek his kingdom? How do we seek his righteousness? We spend time with God. What else can we do? I haven't told you when their answer's wrong yet. Come on. Well, I was just going to say that um, a lot of what we do on Christmas is giving. And giving is a righteous So we give to others. It's pretty scripturally based. Um, awesome. Went to uh, my neighbor's houses and spent time with them. Um, I actually have one neighbor on the side of me. He's never home. And it's just his wife and his kids. So I'm, uh, when I used to live at my parents' house, I used to always go over there and you know, the kid would love, you know, hanging out with me and stuff like that. And, you know, his mom's this beautiful Russian lady and stuff like that. So when he would come home, his wife would come out and, like, smile and wave at me. It probably looked really weird. And, <laughs> and I always felt really uncomfortable because I could tell he was a little bit, I think, more so upset that his work wife made it so that he couldn't be home all the time and stuff. And, um, and you know, I feel like how the world can be. So... Yesterday I saw him outside, and I was able to use Christmas at the time to kind of um, have peace with him and kind of make a make a ground on where I stood with him and his relationship as him being a neighbor and stuff like that, um, which was nice. <laughs> Relationships. Amen. How else? Spend time with God. Give to others. Build relationships. How else do we seek his kingdom? Reading his word. Reading his word. John? I'm going to talk about somebody who's not here since I can talk about them since they're not here. But this <laughs> describes a lot of you in this room as well. Being newcomers here, there have been a lot of people who have reached out to us and made us feel welcome here. It goes for just about everybody and every table unless you're visiting here. But Luke had never gone to Janice has finally figured it out. This is what she told me. She thinks, she believes that every morning Luke and Deborah get together and they say, okay, who can do the most different things to help somebody out today? <laughs> At the end of the day, they figured out well, who won today. <laughs> who can get the most things for somebody else? That's how we feel about it. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Who has John 14 and 15? If you love me, you will keep my commandments. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. What are those commandments? Yeah. Some of the things we just talked about. <clears throat> well, one of them is love one another. Love one another. Wow. 
Wayne, he never ceased to amaze me. Would someone read Matthew 22, 37 and 38? And he said to him, You should, shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and foremost commandment. I just wanted you to read that to, to say that Wayne's wrong. It's not love one another. It's love the Lord your God with all your heart and mind and your strength. Well, that's right? the same point's like. Yes. Yeah. Well, really? Uh, so you're going to say that uh, Mark captured a little more when he, he wrote that one down. Someone read Mark 12 and 30. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. So you should love your neighbor as yourself. Austin, right? It's in part. Is it? Love your neighbor as yourself. This is two, two different scriptures captured in two different chapters, two different books. So love your neighbor as yourself as a priority. I have to love my neighbor as a priority. It's one of the top three or four things that I should be doing in, in, in my life. It depends on who your neighbor is. <laughs> Some neighbors are not very nice. So it says, love your neighbor as yourself, except for those that are not very nice. That's the, not, not the NIV. That's the Margaret version. That's not my Florida neighbors. That's something that happens in Texas. Well, what, what, what about me? What about me? What about my needs? Right? Don't I have to take care of my family first? Because that's sort of where Steve goes a lot in his book, is taking care of your family first. You look at the things that you did yesterday. You look at the things you did over the last four Saturdays. I'm going to wager to guess that a lot of them were family-oriented. You did things for your family. You spent time with family. But Jesus says to us, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and all your mind. If you're going to love him, you're going to spend time with him. As Connie said, if you're going to love him, you're going to read the scripture. And then love your neighbor like yourself. Not love your family. Not love your kids. Not even love your spouse right there. But love your neighbor as yourself. Huh. It's a little tough. That's a priority. I think we get so wrapped up sometimes with our families, with who is right in our immediate vicinity, that we totally forget about those around us. I mean, we've got frustratingly annoying neighbors, but there are times when they need help too, and there's times where you think to yourself, oh man, what now? But then you think back to God's, and what Jesus said in God's commandments, and it really, it, it helps around you, it helps humble you. You know, it's not just my immediate family. There's those around us that need our assistance as well, and it's our opportunity to show Christ-like love to them that they might not get. So that's a great point. Would you view your family as Christians? Yes. As saved? Yes. As going to heaven? Yes. There, there is a, an amazing lack of qualifiers in that statement. <clears throat> Love your neighbors. Yeah. I, I want to pick on Adam for just a second. I'll come back to you. Guys, I'm done. <laughs> no, you're good. You're good. <laughs> Every thought I've had. Just do most of us in here, including that, do you feel your family saved? They're heading on the right path for the most part. A little hiccup maybe here and there, but yeah. But that's where we spend our time, right? That's where we put our energy. Focused on our families for the most part, in many cases. When God told us we should be focused on our neighbor as ourselves. Matthew 23 and 12. Whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and whoever humbles himself will be exalted. 
You mean we aren't the first priority? Ourselves? You, you sort of see a theme in what Jesus is saying here? Because I know when I think about my, my priorities, my priorities a lot. My real priorities, not priorities down to say to you all. <laughs> my real priorities seem to deal with me, seem to deal with my family, seem to deal with those kinds of things. We'll get to a few more here in a minute. He's got Mark 9.35. And he sat down and called the twelve. And he said to them, if anyone would be first, he must be last of all and servant of all. Continuing the theme, right? So let me tell you about one of my lifelong priorities. Well, if I had plenty of money, I could do more to take care of others. Right? How many have had that as a priority? It, it, what I'm saying is, I need to focus on work a little bit, because if I focus on work and making money, while others in the church focus on needs and taking care of people, those who need saving, you know, I, I can fund the work. You ever heard that in a sermon? Have you ever heard, you know, we are all different parts of the body? I've actually heard a sermon where where someone justified someone else purely focusing on making money because they made money well. And they tithe. So they, they're the making money part of being a Christian, of the Christian group. Because others are working, they don't make as much money, so they, they work as in Bible studies. They work at saving people. While, while someone who's really good at making money makes money and gives a lot of money to the church, so the church can function and go on its path. As a, as a priority. I tithe, right? I should work more so I can give more to God. Of course, I keep the other 90%. I mean, what the government doesn't get. So I'm good, right? My work is my priority. Because I give 10% of everything I get from my job to God. And it's good. It's a lot of money. Nowhere did Jesus say that. Nowhere did he say, spend more time at work <laughs> so you can make more money for God. Not that he didn't say, be efficient with your money. Matthew 6 and 24. No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love his other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and but I get my tithe, don't I? <laughs> you mean that shouldn't be my priority? Even though I'm good at it? Matthew 23 and 23. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you tithe mint and dill and cumin and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice, mercy, faithfulness, these you ought to have done without neglecting the others. So what's more important? What did Jesus say is more important? Justice and mercy. Faithfulness. You show justice and mercy and faith. What are you doing? What are your actions? Loving your neighbor as yourself? Or, or what did he say? Worrying about your job for the majority of your life so that you can tie and get your 10%. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, for worrying about your tithe and not doing the stuff that mattered. That's what Jesus said. Luke 12 and 29 through 31. And do not seek what you will eat and what you will drink, and do not keep worrying. For all these things the nations of the world eagerly seek. For your Father knows that you need these things. But seek his kingdom, and these things can be added to you. Again, going on what John said earlier, seek his kingdom. Seek his kingdom. Don't worry about the other stuff. It'll be added if you seek his kingdom. 
Seek righteousness. Seek all these things, and everything you need will be provided. <clears throat> so when we look at the priorities in our life, are our priorities focused on seeking God and trusting that God's going to give back to us? Or are our priorities focused on, hmm, I've got to make a great living. I've got to take care of the money. I've got to do this stuff to make sure that my family's provided for, whether it's cooking meals or earning a living. And, and I'm not doing all this other stuff I could be doing for God because I'm taking care of my stuff and I'm not trusting that God's going to take care of me in the end by doing his stuff. <coughs> Luke 12 and 34. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. So back to my priorities. Isn't it okay to have work as a priority? If I, if I give more than tithe back to God, I tell you, most of my life, my work was a, one of my top three priorities, if not one. And the poor, give to them, give to other charitable needs. Luke 18, 22 and 23. When Jesus heard this, he said to him, One thing you still lack, sell all that you possess and distribute it to the poor, and you shall have treasure in heaven, and come follow me. But when he had heard these things, he became very sad, and he was extremely rich. We know this story, right? You know, Gary's preached on it once, I know I preached on it at least twice. It's a good thing God wasn't talking to us, right? It's a good thing Jesus wasn't talking to us, he was talking to his disciples. I'm going to give you that story. God didn't want me to give up everything I have, right? He didn't want me to sell my car. Does he? He didn't want me to give up my job I'm comfortable in to do something that might be more soul-saving. Hmm. Matthew 7, 24. Every, everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. So back to last week, back to our foundation. Is it easy to do the things that Jesus is telling us to do? For priority? I'm going to, one of my, one of my things that I did yesterday, top three things I did is I watched football for at least five hours. I was on a plane for most of the day yesterday, but I still got in five hours of football watching last night. Over the past four Saturdays, I probably watched more college football during my waking hours than anything else. You know, Bedlam happened, OU, OSU, SEC Championship, Arkansas lost at least twice. There were lots of things to see on Saturdays over the last four weeks, let alone being glued to the TV on Sunday afternoon because I'm in the fantasy football league. John? Are you bragging or confessing? <laughs> I, I, I tend to confess when I teach. But those are my priorities. And because football is such a big priority in my life, I want to tell you a little football story here, and then we'll, we'll get to what Paul said. I mean, did anyone else watch football last night? Indianapolis Colts. Do you want to know the coach of the Indianapolis Colts? His name's Frank Reich. Frank Reich went to the University of Maryland on a football scholarship. He was quarterback, but he never really was the starter. He played behind another guy named Boomer Esiason. Everyone heard of Boomer Esiason? Some of us. So he went through his college career pretty much as a backup. He had a couple of games where he came in, did really well, but Never better than Boomer was. And then he was drafted into the National Football League by the Buffalo Bills, where he became a very good backup to a guy named Jim Kelly, Hall of Fame quarterback. So he's there, backup for years to Jim Kelly. And he did well in a couple of games when Jim got hurt. And then came the 1992 regular season. And on the last game of the season, 
The Houston Oilers defeated the Buffalo Bills 27-3 in Houston. And in that game, Jim Kelly got hurt. And Frank Reich came in and played the very end of the game. So because of this loss, the very next week in the wild card game, and there was only one in each division back then, the Buffalo Bills played the Houston Oilers again. And they played them in Buffalo. Well, early in the third quarter, the Houston Oilers had the Buffalo Bills down 35-3. to 35-3 to in the third quarter. And Frank Reich led the biggest comeback in history in the NFL. Where they went on a 38-3 run to win 41-38 in overtime. Yeah. <laughs> well, you're probably the only one in the room who can remember Houston Oilers, right? The biggest comeback in history. And you know what Frank did when they interviewed him after the game? He quoted a Christian song. And he quoted scripture. And he said, all my life God's been leading me to this moment where I can say this in front of me. All his life as backup. Well, he, he went on and played as a backup for a few more years. But, but because he was a very religious guy, Frank went into seminary when he retired as the NFL quarterback. Not only did he go into seminary, he got his master's in theology. He became president, excuse me, president of the, of the Valentine Presbyterian uh, a Reformed Theological Seminary in Charlotte, and a, and a pastor at the Valentine Presbyterian Church. And not only did he get his master's there, he served as the president of that Charlotte campus for three years. And then Frank decided, I got a cushy job. I'm surrounded by Christians. My family's Christians. My friends are Christians. I work at a Christian institution. But am I saving souls surrounded by all these Christians? Adam, what did you say earlier when, when I asked you if you, you consider your family all saved? Yes. Yes. Same place Frank Wright was. So Frank said, I need a job change because I'm not doing the Lord's work. Pretty crazy for a guy working at a seminary. So Frank decided he was going to go into coaching. So Frank went as president of a seminary and took his first coaching position. His first coaching position was a coaching intern with the Indianapolis Colts. You know how much money a coaching intern makes in the NFL? Not much. He was a coaching intern from 2000, for 2006 and 2007. And then he worked his way up in 2008 to an, an assistant coach to assistant coaching staff position, where his head coach was a guy named Tony Dungy. How many have heard of Tony Dungy? What do you know about Tony Dungy? One thing you know about Tony Dungy? Christian. Christian. Not a coincidence that these two happen to be placed together. So he worked for Jim Caldwell, who worked for Tony Dungy. When Tony Dungy retired, Jim Caldwell was made the head coach. Well, Reich now became the quarterback's coach. So over a five-year period, he worked his way up to quarterback's coach. And then in 2011, when the team went 2-14, and 14, they were all fired. Left his cushy job, seminary president, intern, worked his way up the coaching ladder, then he gets fired. Then he got hired as a wide receivers coach for the Arizona Cardinals in 2012. Then in December of that year, he got fired, along with the rest of the coaching staff. Then he was hired by the San Diego Chargers. Following his coach at the time, Dan Wisenhut. And then when Dan left to go coach the Tennessee Titans, Wright was promoted to the offensive coordinator of the San Diego Chargers. And then God really smiled on him. Because in, 20, in 2016, 
I was retired. Wright was hired as the offensive coordinator of the Philadelphia Eagles. <laughs> How about that? Go birds. <laughs> and two years later, he was the offensive coordinator for the team that won the Super Bowl with a couple of very religious quarterbacks that they happened to draft for more than just their playing skills. And then Frank Wright went to Indianapolis as their head coach four years ago. I tell you this long story to help you understand Frank's journey because Frank didn't focus on the money. Frank didn't do what was easy so he could spend his time with his family and be around other Christians. Frank left his comfortable job to go take a job where he could have the most influence on the greatest number of people and a platform that he was destined to take advantage of. So, about a month ago, Frank and Indianapolis Colts were back in Buffalo, playing Buffalo in the same stadium where he led the greatest comeback ever in NFL history, where he, in front of reporters, talked about a Christian song and read scripture. Except now, after this victory that he had over Buffalo, he had a little greater platform as a head coach. So I want to read a little bit from the Indianapolis newspaper here. Wright knows he's a football coach first and foremost, but there have been times in his four seasons as the Colts coach that he wanted to say something more. A lot of times, particularly in 2020, he's spoken about issues such as the fight against racism or the battle against the COVID-19 pandemic, but this this time was a little personal. Now I'll quote Frank. Some people know that our team has been using the metaphor of climbing Mount Everest to parallel our quest to make it to the top. And it doesn't take long to figure out that the metaphor doesn't merely apply to football, Frank said. In fact, it can be a picture of many of the challenges we all face. Right? We all face mountains. Mountains that we struggle with trying to climb. Well, I just wanted to offer an encouragement, a word of encouragement, really, to anyone out there who's in the midst of a struggle. In particular, I'm thinking of, of a few friends that I know who are going through stuff. The Colts started 1-4 and four this season. They're, I believe they just won their division last night. Frank went on in this, his interview, and he said, almost 30 years ago, after a really big game, right down the hall, in a press conference, I shared the lyrics of a song that meant a lot to me. They really spoke to where I get my strength from. The song, It's in Christ Alone, it was written by Sean Craig, Wright said. I'm not going to recite the whole song, but I, I'm not going to recite the whole song like I did in the locker room back in 1993. But I do want to share a very small snippet to encourage anyone who's climbing a mountain. The chorus says, in Christ alone, I place my trust. And I find my glory in the power of the cross. In every victory, let it be said of me that my source, the source of my strength, the source of my hope is in Christ alone. And there's one small snippet of the second verse, which is my favorite line, that says, I seek no greater honor than just to know him more. Wright went on and he said, even though it was almost 30 years ago when I read these words here in this stadium. <clears throat> this week I was reminded of Hebrews 13 and 8, which says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. Wright said, the reason we're here some 30 years later, not living in the past, but attempting to press on, my encouragement is to keep on finding strength and power that you need in Jesus Christ, no matter what mountain that you're trying to climb. Frank would have never gotten that platform as the head of a seminary. Frank wouldn't, wouldn't have built the team that he built. By the way, he picked up Carson Wentz from the Eagles when they were ready to dump him. What's the first thing you'd say about Carson Wentz? Anyone who knows him? Anyone? He's a Christian. In pregame warm-ups, he wore an audience of one shirt for his found, his Christian foundation with a big cross in the middle. You know, 
but not big beats, headphones, or anything else. Because Frank Wright surrounds himself with Christians that they can work on to create other Christians. I, I don't know how many people have been baptized on that team, but I know the Philadelphia Eagles, when Frank was there, had seven baptisms of players in one season. Professional football players. I say this to say that our path may not always be comfortable. And if our priorities are focused on what God wants our priorities to focus on, he'll take care of the rest. Frank's a perfect example of a man who gave up his cushy job to start as an intern for a professional football team. And now as a head coach. Let's take a few minutes and see what Paul had to say about our priorities. Philippians 4, 6 through 8. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, if there is any excellence and if anything worthy of praise, dwell on these things. Our request to God, give us peace. <clears throat> and, and with that, we focus on the things that God wants us to focus on. And our priorities lead us in that direction, towards God and away from the world. Romans 12 and 2. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. That by testing, you may discern what is the will of God. <clears throat> What is good and acceptable and perfect? Philippians 2 and 4. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. 1 Timothy 4 and 8. For while bodily training is of some value, godliness is of value in every way, as it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. And 2 Timothy 2 and 22. So flee youthful passions and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace, along with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. So as we build on the foundation that we talked about two weeks ago, foundation of wisdom that we will only get if we ask for it from God, our number one pillar to build this house that we are to build here on earth have the right priority. Now I want to I want you to take your sheets with you this week and I want you to, to look at those priorities. This is a this is a rhetorical question right now. Are those priorities the right priorities? And, and if your priorities that you wrote down are the right priorities, do the actions that you have on an everyday basis match up with those priorities? Not I can get there this path. Do they, do they match up? Are your actions first and foremost targeted towards the priorities? The priorities that God wants us to have. Will you pray with me as we close? Dear God, our Father in heaven, we thank you again for the opportunity that we have to study your word. We thank you for Steve and his book and the story of Jacob and Esau. And, and Father, we Thank you for Jesus and the example that he laid out for us. We thank you for Paul and the life change that he had. We thank you for Frank Wright and for other examples like that of people who are showing the world that their priority is you and putting you first. Father, we pray that as we look at our lives in this study and as we build our house on a foundation of wisdom, Father, that we will make sure that our priorities are right and that we, we will make sure that our, our actions and the activities that we have and the plans that we make and the direction that we go are in line with those priorities and the priorities that you want us to have. And Father, we pray that as we do this individually, we'll do this as a church and we'll focus on what you would have us do. We will have the life that you have in store of us, for us. Father, we pray this prayer and we ask for your blessings 
on us and all those around us in this holiday season. And Jesus Christ, our <coughs> loving Savior, and our hope and our salvation. In his name, amen. amen. Thank you. Next week, chapter two. Pillar number two.